Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land, how are you? Is the bird on the wing, the snail on the thorn, God is in his heaven and all is well with the world? Or, as another way of putting it, is life bumps a daisy? In this video, we're taking a look at seven aspects of realist literature. So, without further ado, let's get stuck in, shall we? So, if you've been watching my channel for a little while, you'll know that um, I've been doing some videos on aspects of literature, what constitutes a certain mode of literature. And we've looked at, um, I think it's the seven aspects of romantic literature, and then an offspring of romance, which is Gothic, and the eight aspects that you find in Gothic literature. But realism was a huge, huge movement in literature through the 19th century. Um, its roots, you really stem back to Balzac um, in the 1830s, and it begins to grow with Charles Dickens, although not explicitly a realist, he has an influence. And by the 40s and the 50s, it's beginning to gain momentum. And of course, through the latter end of the 19th century, there's a lot of realist literature. But what aspects constitute the realist genre? Well, if you fancy having a go at writing realist literature, Sit back, grab a coffee, and take some notes as we go along through the seven aspects of realist writing. So the first aspect of realistic literature is very similitude. That feeling and sense that what you're reading is true and real. One of the ways that's achieved is by the story should feel like it could take place anywhere to any one. It's in the sort of humdrum, quotidian, jog-trotty, everyday, run-of-the-mill scheme of things and ideas that can happen to any ordinary person around the world. So you could be writing a story based in New York or in Johannesburg or in Lima or in Tokyo, but the reader will be able to say, yeah, this could as easily happen in a village down the road from me because the sensation of the, the inner thoughts, the emotions of the character are very, very real. And there's nothing contrived that gets in the way of the story. You know when you read a whodunit and the plot's got so complicated that to resolve it, the author seems to jump in and give the most lucky break to the detective to help him solve the crime. And you think that would never happen. You've broken the very similitude, you've broken the realism of the piece. It's no longer what would happen in real life. So an example in literature, if you think of the Count of Monte Cristo, if you've read it, you have Edmund Dantes, don't you? And there he is on his wedding day and he's arrested. This is not a spoiler, it happens on page one. He's arrested and whipped off to the Chateau d'If. He doesn't know why he's been arrested, but there he meets his um, elderly prison mate and he's taught all about this hidden treasure, Sparda's gold, and he works out how to escape from Chateau Diff on coconuts. And that's not like sailing in a coconut. I think it's a mattress of coconuts he makes to float on. I think that's right. And off he goes. And then later on the story develops and you've got the count turns up and all the, the grandeur. And this would not happen every day. This would not happen anywhere at any time. This is a very unique situation and therefore you can pretty much from the off rule it out as being realistic. It's a romantic tale. On the other hand, if you had a story which talked about living in a tenement building with neighbours who play music too loud and another person upstairs who takes drugs, and then one day there's a bit of a, an incident at the bottom of the, the flats and a fight breaks out and you're involved or the protagonist is involved, but only to a minor degree, and yet something bad happens and the police come after him. This could happen anywhere. This doesn't have to happen in a tenement building. This doesn't have to happen in a city. This doesn't have to happen in a particular continent. It can happen to anybody, anywhere. And so it becomes everyday. 
it gives you very similitude. Yes, I believe that this can happen. And often this, you know, even if you've got people in high society, their feelings of jealousy, their feelings of anger, their feelings of envy and revenge, we relate to that. So as long as it's not born of just a very unique clique of people um, with very specific circumstances, even if you are from an, uh, an elite group, as long as the tail, the challenge, the obstacles are something anyone could have, you could easily rewrite it into any class of people, then you've got verisimilitude. So that's number one. The second aspect of realist literature is a, is a bit of a double-barreled one. They go hand in hand. And that is realist literature is very detail-oriented whilst also being quite detached in the way it expresses those details. So you, you get quite a few pastoral um, tales back in the 18th century, uh, 19th century, even the latter end. And you've got very detailed bucolic settings, you know, the, the church in, the, in the, the land with beautiful countryside roundabout and the distant rolling fields of corn. Now, it may sound like a, a beautiful idyllic setting, and we don't always associate that with realism, but it can be real because you get a great amount of detail. Things like the church was Norman and it was founded by Sir Fitzherbert of Gascony. And there was an extension built just 30 years ago by the previous curate. And he was related to such and such who lives down the road in a hovel next to the tavern. Okay, so you've got all these details. And that's what realist literature very much focuses on. Even at the positive points, it focuses on detail. Why? Because it wants to immerse you, to make you feel that sense of the everyday, that sense of reality and truth. So you feel completely, yes, this is a living, breathing, moving village, city, building, whatever it may be, it's real. This can even happen in magical realism where you create another world altogether. But through detail, you, the reader, come to believe in the, the veracity of the world you are learning about, that you are occupying with the protagonist. More significantly, though, those details tend to look at mm, the down and dirty. So go to Dickens, for instance. Um, Dickens will describe the slums of London. He will describe the back alleyways and streets and the garbage, and he'll describe in detail the clothing of characters. Now, some of you watching might say, well, Dickens isn't a realist novelist. I suppose in the strictest sense, he's not, um, because he caricatures and gargoyalizes a lot of his characters, so they're not real, but they're recognizable. But his subject matter, is very, very real. You look at the way he describes the workhouse in Oliver Twist. It's very real. Um, yes, I think it's Mr. Bumble, um, the beadle. He's not exactly a real character. Um, he's very enlarged, and so not like the everyday. But the description of the workhouse, how the children look, how they move, what they eat, what they suffer, the way Oliver talks to his little friend who's dying pretty much of disease and starvation, you know, it breaks your heart. And it's this, it's this realistic detail of the down and dirty, which adds to a realist piece of work, which is why Oliver Twist was able to effect change, because people could buy into it. Now, going way, 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 way back, um, you've got Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. And of course, that doesn't really fall into the era of the realist literature, yet despite the fact it's written in, what, 1720, 1730, somewhere around there, it was passed off as an autobiography at the time to be real. And when you read Robinson Crusoe, um, so much of it is detail-oriented. Now, granted, not everyone could have the experience of Crusoe. You know, being sold into slavery, escaping, building a plantation, coming off, getting shipwrecked, getting away. But when he's on the island, the level of detail, when he removes things from the shipwreck, 
the detail. When he builds his fort, the detail. When he makes a calendar, the detail. That all adds to a sense of believability, which is why the public thought it was actually a true story. Now take this into the 19th century and we get this a lot. Real detail about people's thoughts, people's emotions, and real everyday objects, insignificant objects, like someone could be sitting sewing in a George Eliot novel, those kind of things. Now, one of the ways this is achieved, which is really, really interesting, is through the accuracy of description. A narrator may decide not to use metaphor and simile. The reason for that is because that colors the lens of what is actually being seen. Realism wants truth, things as they are. Almost the word equals the thing with no reference to anything else. So if I were to write, London was the maelstrom of Europe, a swirling vortex pulling in people from all over the continent into its dangerous moor, okay? That is not an accurate description of London. That's not real. We can believe it, but it's slanted, it's coloured by the narrator. It's not exactly how London is. Nor could I say London is like a dragon sleeping upon mounds of gold collected from its colonies. While you could believe that, while that would be evocative, it's not accurate. So, in a realist novel, you might get something like um, London, built along the banks of the Thames, was covered by something between a mist and a fog. One could easily make out the silhouettes and outlines of its buildings. Some tall and thin, others rotund, some great, some small and ragged. Some would call London beautiful, others would call it ghastly. But what was certainly true is that within its alleyways and back streets, disease, poverty and filth were found everywhere. Now that's still evocative, but it's quite accurate. It gets you into the picture. It pulls you in and you believe you are in London without this flight of fancy. So that's another aspect of realist literature. It is detail oriented and it tries to be detached, not influencing you with the author's emotions. The third aspect of realist literature, um, as is generally how true, is that it concerns itself with the middle class to the lower class of society. Um, a lot of work before this, um, take for instance Jane Austen, who is it concerned with? It's concerned with the upper class or the lower upper class. And although her works actually do have a scent of realism about them, it's this fact that she operates in a very particular strata, which is not the most common experience of people, that one of the reasons it distinguishes it from being realist in totality. Whereas you look at the later works of authors, um, you think of authors like Hardy and Tolstoy and Turgenev and, and the Brontes and Gaskell. There's a good example, Gaskell. They concern themselves with the middle to lower classes and they get into the detail of that because that's real life for most people. They are the people who underpin all of high society. They are the people upon whom empires are built. So they are the, the real truth of the world, not the upper class, but the middle to lower. And of course the middle factoring quite heavily because although we sometimes think of realism as gritty, down and dirty and in the slums, the middle class have huge political clout. They manoeuvre events massively in society and particularly in the 19th century when the growing merchant class from the 18th century really established itself, was crawling up, getting baronetcies and getting themselves into parliament. You know, that was real life, but they also had a touch with the lower classes as well. So when looking for this, I mean, you'll, you'll find this all over the place. George Eliot writes Middlemarch, this sweeping panorama of what? Middle to lower class life in the Midlands. I mentioned Gaskell, 
um, her most famous work, North and South. So let's take it. Margaret Hale. Who is she? She's got a little bit of money. She has somebody in London who lives in a posh area, her aunt. But she is the daughter of a pretty out of the way curate. And they move to the North. It's Milton, isn't it, they go to. And they, they move to the North. There's a great deal of description of their lodgings. Um, there's a great deal of description of the cotton mills and the people that she meets. The people she mixes with are the workers. And you have the, the girl with like tuberculosis, not tuberculosis, but she's got a breathing problem. And then you have, um, I can't remember the guy's name right now, but it will come to me. He, is it Mr. Thornton? He is a mill owner and you get a bit of his backstory and you get descriptions of his life. But look at him, he's middle class, but he's grown from the bottom. He's come up from the lower orders and she's sort of middle class, but with high order connections. And then it's surrounded by the struggle for forming a labor union by the poor. Do you see, this is all set in what people would recognize. They would say, yes, this is my town. Yes, this is my village is, is impacted like this. It was real. So that's the third aspect of realist literature. Its focus is primarily on the middle to the lower orders of society. The fourth aspect of realist literature is one that makes this genre such a powerful genre for influencing change. And that is its reserved critique of society, of societal norms and mores, of critiques of certain institutions or morality of the day. Because remember, realism is what people experience and life is not all angel hair and sweetness. It's got troubles. People know that there is a difficulty. Remember, we're looking at a lot, at a lot of times, the lower classes or the middle classes being stuck, not being able to get any higher in their life. People being restrained and con, um, constrained in their situation, never able to fulfill their, their full potential. And a, a lot of that is because of the way society is set up. And so what you get with realist literature is it gives a critique, and I say sort of a reserved one. It's not dogmatic revolutionary normally, but it makes something clear that here, I'm shining a light, this is one of the problems. So who would you use as an example for that? Um, someone I think is brilliant at this, Tegenev, Ivan Tegenev, the Russian writer who writes Fathers and Children. Now, what's so brilliant about that book, um, it really struck me when I read it last year, actually, is that Turgenev doesn't seem to take a side. You've got these two characters, Arkady and Batsarov, and then you've got their fathers who belong to the old order of the way things should be. But Arkady and Batsarov, they've come from university and they want to change matters. And the way they go about it, is real. You see their thoughts, you see what they're fighting against, you see them pick holes in things, but you also, because Tegenev doesn't take sides, so it's reserved, he allows you, the reader, to see they've got a point, that's a problem. But also you see from the father's side, and from things that happen, specifically to Bazarov, that not everything is okay with his way of thinking. And what you get so brilliantly in that book is Turgenev is looking at society. He can see the tumult. He can see the clash of ideas between the young and the old, between the status quo and the theories of a university. But he shines a light and says, none of this is perfect. You've got to sort of work between all this. This won't solve everything. And the way it's brought about, again, with high detail, with high focus on individuals from, although Arkady, you could say, has upper class father, he himself doesn't act upper class at all, and Bazarov is very much lower order. So you've got all the aspects of realist literature, but what it does is this reserved critique. 
Turgenev does not come out and say, revolution, tip over the old order, nor does he say, the old order must stand fast, conservatism, the, the universities are out to ruin everything. He doesn't say that. He's not dogmatic. He's just very reserved. But what he does critique is society is in a bit of trouble, and he points out some areas from both sides and why they've both got problems. He was so good at that, in fact, that when he released the book, the students of Moscow turned on him, saying that he was for the old guard. Simultaneously, the old guard turned on Turgenev, saying he was an upstart anarchist. I mean, how brilliantly real he must have been to step between two ideologies which impose their colour on the world, and he just had a reserved opinion, just critiqued it. In some respects, you could say he's almost, that's almost the epitome of realist literature. He managed to pull off what a realist writer wants to do, to tell the truth, to be accurate, make it feel real, and not colour it with the author's own ideas. So that was the fourth aspect, a critique of society, but a restrained one. The fifth aspect of realist literature is extremely interesting because you would imagine with realism, with going for truth, accuracy, detail, focusing on the middle to lower elements of society, critiquing society, you would imagine that realism is a force for change, which it certainly is, but you would imagine it's quite um, an atomic force for change. Uh, a revolutionary force for change. But it's not. There's something about realist literature which is remarkable. No matter what critique comes out of the book, no matter what institution is plucked to shine a light on and to demonstrate all its ugly details, its freckles, its boils, warts at all, as Oliver Cromwell would say, realist books always tend to have an ending that works out. And by work out, I don't mean it's, it has a decent ending which you're happy with. I mean, it's resolved without breaking up society. The reader will recognize in a realist piece of work, the accuracy of the observations. They will feel this is real, this is my life, this is how we experience it. But it doesn't leave the reader at the end with an uncomfortable feeling that their innermost beliefs are wrong, um, that their world, that the life that they live needs to radically alter. Realist literature is not so much a radical piece of writing. It's just honest. It moves you. It raises questions and it raises the thoughts of what could be done to alter society almost within its own confines. So you think of a work like, and I know some will say Dickens is not a realist, but he has a lot of elements. You know, realism would be born a bit later than him, but he was very much there. He was down and dirty, wasn't he? He's, he's always talking about the orphans and the poor and all those kind of things. You think of Fagan going right back. Yes, a caricature, but real characters that existed, and Sykes as well. <sighs> what he does in Bleak House, is remarkable. He really, really skewers the courts of chancery, like really gets at them. He also, although only lightly touching, very lightly touching, um, like with a dry brush, the role of government and the role of missionary societies, he still skewers them. He shows them to be inept. He shows them to be a problem causing the poverty and the hardship for the people of London. But how does the book end? Does it end with a throwing over of the government? Does it end with a new prime minister? Does it end with a, a different Lord Chancellor in charge of Chancery Court? By all means, Tulkinghorn the lawyer dies, but Guppy and Conversation Kenj, they don't die. They're just ordinary lawyers in the run-of-the-mill sort of day. The actual story works out in the end with the aristocracy still where it is, with the legal profession still where it is, with, yes, a few deaths for effect, um, and working out of people's lives, being happy, getting married, and all that. So it, it 
puts it back together so that the reader still feels they're in control of their own life. So this was life. Yes, we need to do something about it, but we don't have to overhaul all of society. And this is a really interesting feature of realism, don't you think? Comment below about this one, because wouldn't you normally imagine realist literature would be so visceral, so highly charged about the wickedness of the world that it would want to alter it? Without really going into the literature, that's your immediate reaction, really, to realism. And yet, a realist piece of work doesn't do that. And I suppose, in a way, that's because the author doesn't want to infect your emotions with his personal ideas. If he's trying to be true, if she's trying to be honest and real, then the author wants to just present things as they are and let you lead the way, which means leaving you at the point where things actually are. And that gives you the worked out ending, sort of almost a happy ending, but at least a resolved ending, which is comfortable. So that was the fifth aspect of realist literature. It tends to have a comfortable worked out ending. Even if it's sad, it's still present day how we feel. A sixth aspect of realist literature is one I especially appreciate in a book, um, no matter what genre it is. And that is, in realist literature, you tend to have a respectful handling of people's moral judgments. Now, what do I mean by that? Easily, when reading a book, the baddie can become super baddie. The goodie can become super good. Or you can hate a character. You can think, what an idiot they are for behaving the way that they do. Or how amazing they are. Sometimes they're so amazing, they're unbelievable, hence removing the realistic verisimilitude. But with realistic literature, what you're going to get is a respectful handling of why characters act the way they do, even if they annoy you. So a couple of examples in that that you could think of. Going early, you would have someone like Balzac in Old Gorio, which I've just read. Um, you've got some, you've got a bunch of different characters. So you've got old Gorio himself, and you watch how he indulges his daughters to his own expense, giving them money to spend almost on vices and whims when they're married to rich people. He's already given them 800,000 francs as a dowry. And yet, when they want to get involved in, you know, shady triests with other people whom they're not married to and need to pay off their debts, it's their father, old Gorio, who bails them out. You've got Rastignac, the young lad who lives at the boarding house with Gorio. Again, here we see the lower orders and um, I, is it the Rue Saint-Neuve where the boarding house is? Something like that. It's a poorer area of town, so these elements of realism. But you see Rastignac, now he's idealistic, but then he wants to climb through society. He doesn't always make the best choices. He can be a bit arrogant at times, but you can... You're, he's handled so well, you still understand where he's coming from. You've got Vautrin, or Vautrin, who has got a bit of a Machiavellian, Mephistopheles kind of edge to him. More than edge. He's quite a dark character. And yet, you don't despise him. You, you worry about his effect on Rastignac. You don't despise him, you at least see where he's coming from. Madame Vauquer is the same. She's money grasping and she's annoying and it's, she's not a person you want to be friends with, but you at least understand where she's coming from. And then you've got um, the two daughters of Old Gorio. You know, at times you can actually despise the attitude they've got, but what Balzac does is a bit later, after you're beginning to really condemn them and, you know, d dislike them and judge them, he then tells you a little bit more about the way they're thinking, which makes you go, well, okay, I still wouldn't do that, and they are in the wrong, but I at least understand. And it's the same with Madame Bossin, the, the uh, rich, the rich high society woman who is related to Paul Rastignac, and 
her affairs in love and the way she conducts herself with absolute propriety, primness, she's impeccable in the top of society. Um, and you can sort of look down on this lack of naturalness. But then you learn more about her and you think, well, I at least see where she's coming from. And this is a brilliant aspect because that book is a realist piece of literature. Um, fascinating to read. It's got all the elements we've already talked about. But this, this idea comes right through. You begin to think, ah, oh, I at least understand them. So here's a pastoral book for you. Um, which you could think is romantic on the face of it, but I would certainly say is a realist piece of work, and that's Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. So you look at Tess and the situation she gets herself into. Her naivety can make you despair at times. Uh, for any of you who have read the book, the, uh, the slipping of the envelope under the door, door scene, right? Oh, drove me mad. I wanted, wanted, wanted to shake the girl, lover. But you understand where she's coming from, despite her weaknesses. Angel Clare, his role, I mean, he's a very warm character to, to be drawn to to start with. If somewhat, some might think he's a little pretentious and above himself. But nonetheless, he does things which, I mean, forget shaking someone, you want to biff him on the nose. But... He's respectfully handled. It's not like Hardy ever says, he's an idiot for acting this way. He's stupid. What a fool. No, he's like, oh, well, this is how it is. This is how someone conducted themselves. And if we step back and calmly assess it, you can at least understand his moral judgments, even if you disagree with them. And even if you realize he recognizes they're wrong in the end, you know, I'm not going to hate the guy. I see where he was coming from. This is a factor of realist literature, which I really like. It actually contributes to the last factor by not sort of lambasting a character for their actions. What it allows is for the author to bring about that respectful, rounded ending, which puts you back into an ordinary life. You don't have to come away resenting people you can understand people. And it's one of the great things about fiction over non-fiction is how it develops empathy and realist literature is very, very good at that. The seventh aspect of realist literature is, it's not controversial, but neither is it 100% categoric because there are exceptions to this. But I suppose realist literature is more responsible than anything for making this feature. It is the omniscient narrator. The omniscient narrator, third person, can look down on the world, but unlike some narrators who explain what's going on here, then move over and explain what's going on over there, the omniscient narrator knows absolutely everything. The characters have no privacy whatsoever, no hidden thoughts, no private feelings. The omniscient narrator needs them he or she dips in to bring out feelings which you relate to. Um, thoughts which are going on which help you understand their moral judgments. Or perspectives on seeing life which you recognise and agree with. Or even arguments you've heard from others and now are able to listen to them because you're involved with the protagonist. On the one hand, the omniscient narrator could pose a problem for realism. It allows, at any point, the author to step in and taint, infect, colour the story of the protagonist and maybe lean with some imagery of their own, causing you to see the world in a particular way. That being a weakness is also one of its massive strengths because no form of life that we live is 100% accurate. This, by the way, is the reason it's hard to define some books as whether they're realist or not, because there's no such thing as being totally accurate with language. Language will always have symbolic meanings beneath what we say. You know, if I said um, darkness hung over London, OK, now I could be being absolutely literal, meaning it's darkness, but 
I've said hung. Darkness does not hang. Also, putting that word now makes darkness have a feeling of unease when actually it might be a perfectly peaceful night. So I could say London was dark, but even that has a symbolic meaning, an imagery meaning, if depending on how you read it, meaning London was sinister, but I might just be saying London was dark, there were no lights on. And so there's a limit uh, to how real something can be. So in the endeavor to become real, true to facts, the omniscient uh, narrator can do something brilliant. They know exactly what the protagonist is thinking and characters and all people do think in terms of imagery, in terms of relativity, words relating to one another, ideas relating. We all think in terms of simile and metaphor, okay? So if I said he wore a bottle green coat, okay? Is it literally a bottle green coat? I'm relating a coat to the color of a bottle because that's how we make sense of the world. Now the omniscient creator, uh, creator, the omniscient narrator is able to then express emotion, bring us into the world of their protagonist by their own similes because the omniscient narrator knows exactly what they're thinking, knows exactly what they're feeling, and they can then express themselves. And then they can give color to their world. And so it is then real because we recognize characters do see things a certain way and they're letting us know how exactly they feel. Now, as my dad always used to say to me, um, you can never judge a feeling. You may think someone's wrong for feeling a certain way, but you can't judge that they're not right. You can't say, no, you don't feel sad. Well, I do feel sad. I may not be justified, but I do feel sad. And that's the same with the omniscient creator. He can allow the protagonist to tell you exactly how they feel. And so you can relate to them and it becomes real. You may react differently in a situation, but you can say, yes, I know people who would react just like this. This could happen to anyone, in any place, at any time. It is real. Going right back to verisimilitude at the beginning. So that is quite a significant facet of a lot of realist literature. You can have first person um, narrators in realist literature, but in the 19th century especially, it would have been dominated by the omniscient narrator. And probably my favorite example for this would be Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. So the protagonist is Rashkolnikov. We see the world through Rashkolnikov's eyes. It's not in first person because we have some breakaway scenes elsewhere where the narrator goes and lets us know what's happening with different people. But there is not a thought of Rashkolnikov's that is hidden from us. Uh, when he's plotting to do in the old lady, we go through all the turmoil of his thoughts. And the way he describes it, yes, that colours the story, but it's not the narrator inflicting his ideas upon the story. It's Rashkolnikov's experience of living at this moment, of thinking through an idea. The way he interacts with Razumihin, and the way Razumihin is himself, we get to see his thoughts towards Rashkolnikov because the narrator is omniscient, knows everything. And this builds up to give us a very, very real world of St. Petersburg at the end of the 19th century. It's so believable, it is real. And interestingly, the book, very interestingly, the book resolves neatly because of the epilogue. Had it not been for the epilogue, yeah, one of the rules for realism to a degree would have been broken. Um, and you'll know what I mean if you've read it. If, if you have read it, by the way, just to let you know, I have done a very in-depth review of Crime and Punishment on another video. So I think it's in the playlist, Understanding Classic Books. So go and have a look. So there were the seven aspects of realist literature. How did you get on with it? Did you enjoy this video? If you did, please, 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 if you're on Facebook or Instagram, could you do me a favor? Um, give me a shout out, recommend me to others, whether it's through your stories or something like that, um, because it really helps and I do really appreciate it. And I want to spread this love of literature, which you obviously have if you're watching this. 
Um, normally at the end of these videos, I would do a little exercise where I'll write out a bit of a story using the aspects to make a very definitive piece of work to the genre. So I did that in the Gothic um, video, Eight Aspects of Gothic Literature. I did it in the Romantic one. Now I haven't got round to doing it just yet. I haven't had time to just sit down. I normally just do it off the top of my head, but I'm busy. So keep your eye out. I will do a very small video where I'll write something based upon the aspects we've looked at in this um, video. And then you can see for yourself whether it makes it sound like the story is happening in real life, realist literature. Before I go, can I just say, are there any other genres you would specifically like me to discuss in this series of what are the aspects of such and such a genre? It could be modernism, it could be sci-fi, it could be mystery, thriller, postmodernism, you name it, and I will get on to do it at some point. So until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.